Tonight, tropical cyclone Kiralee makes landfall in the north, leaving tens of thousands in the dark. Honours and awards, inspirational Australians recognised for their talents, including curing cancer. Invasion Day rallies across the country, marching alongside pro-Palestinian supporters. And shock exit, defending champion Novak Djokovic knocked out of the Australian Open by Italy's Yannick Sinner. Good evening, Jessica Van Vonderen with ABC News. Tens of thousands of North Queenslanders are spending a second night in the dark, with ex-tropical cyclone Kiralee wreaking havoc with the region's electricity network. The Chainsaw Army has been out in force, beginning to clean up from last night's Category 2 system. But much of the region is relieved to have avoided major damage. The severe system brought powerful winds and intense swells. Oh, man. But Kiralee's bark was mostly worse than her bite. It began as a Category 3, but at the last minute, the tropical cyclone crossed the coast as a Category 2, just north of Townsville. Parts of the city really only saw the effects of a Category 1. It's really windy. You can really feel the wind shaking the whole house. Winds up to 107 kilometres per hour were recorded. Off Townsville, this 30-foot yacht smashed and sank. The boat was uninsured. It can't be a nice moment. Um, we've all had close calls, so it's, uh, it's a bit of a scary thing. There were similar scenes at Airlie Beach. A crane was called in to salvage it. Across North Queensland, strong winds have uprooted trees. A bit more damage than I'd expected, I guess. Crushing cars, twisting metal, ploughing through fences and bringing down power lines. Probably a couple of days worth of uh, mess, but um, not too bad, nothing like Yazi. This air church miraculously escaped a tree falling through its roof, but authorities say the region has dodged a bullet. There has been minimal property damage. Uh, the biggest impact at this stage is on the energy network. More than 60,000 customers lost power. Ergon says it could take crews up to a week to restore. We've got about approximately 100 on the ground here locally. Um, we've got 600 mobilising into Townsville um, over today and tomorrow. A sweltering day to be without air conditioning, prompting residents to find innovative ways to keep cool. That's what I was out walking for because it's cooler out here than it is indoors. Traffic lights went dark. Police are pleading for drivers to stay off the roads and intense swells have parked plans for the long weekend. From a tourism perspective, yeah, it certainly had a massive impact. Um, our operations, uh, well, the marine operations have been down since Tuesday, Wednesday. In Bowen, Australia Day was a dual celebration, relieved the town avoided major damage. Very hot at home, very muggy, nice and cool here. Despite a big clean-up ahead, there's a sense of relief here in North Queensland that Kiralee's damage wasn't more severe. The weather system has now moved inland and authorities say it's still posing a risk. It has an extreme amount of moisture through the atmosphere with it and will produce heavy to intense rainfall and could lead to life-threatening flash flooding. In the Gulf Country, bridges are already going under. Over the next few days, we will have isolated communities. Georgetown is cut off, with floodwaters lapping at backyards. We've had some large rainfalls across the catchments of the Gilbert and the Etheridge and the Ainsley Rivers. Other areas, though, missed out on the big falls. We ended up with about 30 mils of rain, but definitely nothing like what had been forecast. Graziers are on the lookout for more. And Lily Knopfling joins me now from Townsville. Lily, residents will be so keen to get that power back on. We're certainly holding out for it, Jess. It has been a hot and sticky day across the region as people cleaned up debris from their homes. Tonight, more than 62,000 customers are without power. Ergon is urging people to be patient and plan for the worst-case scenario, warning it could take up to seven days for all of those outages to be properly resolved. At the same time, Townsville residents are being told to conserve water for personal use only due to the cyclone's impacts on the city 
city's water infrastructure. National and state disaster funding has been made available to North Queensland councils as damage assessments continue and police are ramping up looting patrols in case anyone tries to take advantage in the aftermath of the wild weather. Jess? Lily Northling in Townsville, thank you. To Jenny Woodward now. And Jenny, how much rain did Kiralee bring? Well, Jess, as you would expect, there have been some big totals. Hello, everyone. In the 24 hours to 9am, the highest report was 189 millimetres at Running Creek. Now, that's northwest of Townsville. While Paluma in the Ranges had 176, there was 163 recorded at Mount Garnet, and further north, Ingham picked up 134. Now, the X cyclone is likely to linger in the west over the weekend and potentially into early next week. So there's a severe weather warning for heavy to locally intense rainfall with possible damaging winds over parts of northern Queensland including Richmond, Winton and Cloncurry. Now we've also got a severe storm warning for damaging winds for parts of the Gulf Country, the Northwest and the Channel Country. And I'll have the rest of the day's weather later in the Bulletin, Jess. Thank you, Jenny. And I have to say congratulations because you have been awarded a Medal of the Order of Australia for your service to broadcast media. Thank you, Jess. I am absolutely thrilled and honour honoured and thanks to everyone who sent me messages today. I really appreciate it. I am so grateful for my career and delighted to get this award. And of course, I was just one of many people who were honoured today. So well deserved, Jenny. And that's right, for only the second time, more women than men have received an award in the general division. They say a good deed is its own reward, but for these Australians, it's a king's honour. This year's Order of Australia includes household names like plastic surgeon and 2005 Australian of the Year, Professor Fiona Wood. Her spray-on skin technique saved severely burned victims in the aftermath of the Bali bombings. It is extraordinary to be recognised by one's peers and the community in this way. It's, uh, it really is, sort of takes your breath away. In Adelaide, Dr. David Squirrel couldn't continue practicing after losing most of his sight and hearing in 2008. He spent the next 15 years advocating for improved accessibility for people with disability. It's a challenge and one has to learn to adapt. Yes, you can get depressed, dejected, uh, but you have to rise above that. This year's honors include not one, but two Tasmanian premiers. Robin Gray received an Officer of the Order for his seven years in government in the 1980s. And Laura Giddings, who at 23 was the youngest woman elected to an Australian parliament before eventually becoming Tasmania's first female premier in 2010. My dad's no longer with us, but he was a man who loved his medals and he had a, an Order of Australia medal himself, an OAM though. And I know how much that meant to him and just how proud he would be today. Professor of Criminology at the University of Queensland, Lorraine Maserol, is one of only four Companions of the Order this year, the highest rank. Her research advances innovative policing methods. My research also shows that police, when they work in partnership with communities, when they work in partnership with other um, agencies like schools, they can actually be much more effective than when they work alone. As an Aboriginal community police officer, Yolungu woman Bettina Dangambar is recognised for her work combating domestic violence and training police in providing culturally appropriate support. It's very important because it, it creates, it builds a bridge on how we can work in both ways, Balanda and Yorin. Now, I've been at the weather maps for nearly 40 years. Media identities are also recognised, including ABC Queensland weather presenter Jenny Woodward, Channel 10 newsreader Sandra Sully, former Sunrise host David Koch, and SBS founding member Majida Abu Saab, who helped create the network's first Arabic news service. Not everyone had a phone, but everyone had a radio. Here in Australia, they would listen to information, settlement information in their own language. Television SBS. A posthumous member of the order was awarded to Canberra human rights lawyer Sophie Jessica Trevitt, who fought for Indigenous youth before losing her battle with cancer last July. The same honour was bestowed on the late Reverend Robert John McGuire, known to many simply as Father Bob. Hundred-year-old Lillian Reese is the oldest recipient this year. 
While most people relax in their 80s, she dedicated her twilight years volunteering with sick children and their families. People are not as kind or generous to each other. People always say, I haven't got time, but we always made time. Golden advice from a golden girl and a member of the Order of Australia. Nabil al Nashar, ABC News. Two cancer researchers have been named Australians of the Year, receiving the top honour for their groundbreaking work on melanoma treatment. Professors Georgina Long and Richard Scollier have changed melanoma from a fatal disease to one that's curable. These Australians of the Year have a powerful message about cancer. I stand here tonight as a terminal brain cancer patient. I'm only 57. I don't want to die. Once a life-ending diagnosis, Professors Long and Scolia have made melanoma survivable. Their pioneering treatment activates the patient's own immune system, saving thousands of lives. Now they're experimenting with the same science to fight Professor Scolia's cancer. And make a difference, if not for me, then for others. On a day many spend under southern skies, the Australians of the year want the culture of our sunburnt country to change. There is nothing healthy about a tan, nothing. Our bronzed Aussie culture is actually killing us. An award ceremony that honoured an empire of the sun also honoured the teaching of a language both ancient and contemporary. Yalme Yunupingu has spent 40 years teaching Yongu language. When I speak to people, it's with quiet lightning and thunder, called Maradakton. A force of nature for education and for healing. Our people are sick and dying, young and old. My message is very clear. Yolngu bush medicine and healing is a vital for Yolngu. The 2024 local hero unearthed Australia's passion for paleontology and a multi-million dollar boost for outback tourism. Australia's future is inextricably linked to its past and our children are its future custodians. The more they understand it, the better they will care for it. The Queen of the Commonwealth and Olympic Games is the Young Australian of the Year. Australia's swimming great is now in a new lane as an ambassador for UNICEF. Don't worry about the time it will take to achieve your dreams. We are capable of far more than we realise. Inspirational Australians with a new platform for good. James Viver, ABC News, Canberra. Many Indigenous Australians and their supporters marched in Invasion Day and Survival Day events. Organisers shared the stage with supporters of the Palestinian cause. Around the country, thousands gathered and protested at Invasion Day rallies. We have established here today to call for the government to abolish Australia Day. In Canberra, AFP officers struggle to hold back demonstrators, with the front of Parliament closed off as a protest march reached the doors. This year, Invasion Day organisers invited Palestinian speakers to share the national spotlight. I think it's pretty obvious why we're staunchly standing with Palestinian people. And it's because we know what they're going through. Much like Palestine, always was and always will be Palestinian land. This was the first major gathering since last year's failed referendum and emotions ran high. We're marching for a black future. We're marching for redemption from a failed referendum. We're demanding that white Australia come to the table and actually engage with us in authentic ways. Issues of poor health care, land rights and youth incarceration all featuring in speeches. A lot of us are born into racism. That's the reality. A lot of us are born into poverty. That's the reality. But this government, they criminalise poverty. Every government in the history of Australia has failed Aboriginal people. Invasion Day is our day of remembrance. It is a day we honour the people we no longer have standing with us. Elsewhere, families gathered in a more relaxed setting, 
others holding survival day events. Here in Sydney, high temperatures didn't deter thousands from showing up. The mood here is emotional and energised as protesters demand a new era for Indigenous rights. Carly Williams, ABC News, Sydney. Queenslanders turned out in thousands to mark the National Day, with many marching to pay their respects to First Nations people in protest of the holiday. Queenslanders marched in solidarity with First Australians through the streets of Brisbane. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it now? We're here to stand against invasion. Like others across the country, this year's rally also called for an end to bloodshed in the Middle East. Organisers say every 26th of January, the numbers swell. There is no date to celebrate. Um, there is nothing to celebrate. If we all want to celebrate Australia, let's do the work to make sure that we have something to celebrate. A similar sentiment was echoed on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, there's a lot of non-Indigenous people there too, so it's important that we walk in solidarity. On the Darling Downs, some took advantage of the public holiday. Punters lined up for a race like no other and tested their skills at sack racing. Others showed their billy boiling and thong throwing talents. It's perfect, it's great. Just all the events and everyone coming together. I respect people's opinions on changing the date, but. As it sits today, 2024, we're on the banks of the iconic Oki Weir. Those who had a day off counted their blessings from the Gold Coast to Yabby Racing in Blackall. Down the cricket here today, but we do something every year to celebrate in some way, yeah. The landmark Story Bridge Hotel in Brisbane has long held cockroach races on Australia Day, but has shifted the event to the 27th, sparking some criticism. The hotel says the decision was made solely because of the higher cost of running the event on a public holiday and they are not shying away from celebrating Australia Day. These newly minted Australians beamed from ear to ear, a day that increasingly holds different meanings. Antonia O'Flaherty, ABC News. Israel says it's looking into allegations IDF forces opened fire on crowds in Gaza City, killing 20 Palestinians and injuring 150 waiting in line for food. Thousands of Palestinians are continuing to flee the main southern city of Khan Yunus, where Israeli tanks have battered areas around two hospitals. Meanwhile, near the Israeli border, families of hostages have attempted to block the Karem Shalom crossing in an effort to stop aid trucks going into the strip until all hostages are released. The International Court of Justice is preparing to rule on interim measures requested against the Israeli government over its war in Gaza. South Africa filed a case against Israel, accusing it of committing genocide. Europe correspondent Isabella Higgins is in The Hague for the ruling. Well, all eyes will be on this court with many around the world expected to tune in to this highly anticipated decision. Now, while a final outcome in this case could take years, what we're expecting in a matter of hours is an interim ruling on the emergency measures requested by South Africa to try and rein in Israel's assault on Gaza. Earlier this month, we heard the first legal arguments from both South Africa and Israel. Now, lawyers for South Africa claim that the death and destruction levelled by Israel's military amounts to genocide and claims that genocidal intent has been expressed by all levels of Israel's government. Now, Israel's legal team categorically rejects this. They say that South Africa is grossly distorting the truth and that their actions are justified under international law after Hamas's attack on October 7. So what the judges of the World Court have had to consider is if, whether at first glance or prima facie, if these allegations against Israel could constitute a breach under the Genocide Convention and if emergency measures are needed to protect the rights of people in Gaza. Now, some have gone as far as describing these emergency measures as having the ability to act as a sort of temporary restraining order in this conflict. But while this interim ruling is legally binding for Israel, it can be ignored and this court does not have any way to enforce it. Isabella Higgins reporting.
Former US President Donald Trump has continued to deny sexually attacking writer E. Jean Carroll, claiming the allegation was a hoax. Mr Trump's testimony in a civil defamation trial lasted roughly four minutes and was the first time he spoke in court about the writer's claims. A previous jury found the former president had committed the assault in the 1990s and Ms Carroll was awarded $7.6 million. The man behind one of Japan's deadliest mass murders will be hanged after a judge found he was mentally fit to be criminally liable for an arson attack. Dozens of people were killed when the man set a building on fire using 40 litres of gasoline and a cigarette lighter. It was a grudge that ignited this gruesome attack. In 2019, 36 employees of an animation studio were trapped and killed after their office building was set alight. 32 were injured. The attacker, Shinji Alba, also suffered severe burns and was hospitalised for 10 months. He believed without evidence that the studio was stealing his ideas and researched the use of gasoline for arson. More than 400 people braved Kyoto's cold weather hoping to see the sentencing. Only 23 were selected via a lottery to enter the court. I want to see what kind of attitude the defendant will display. The defence argued Alba suffered a delusional disorder and couldn't be held criminally responsible. But the judge disagreed, describing the crime as tragic in the extreme and the victim's suffering as unfathomable, sentencing the 45-year-old to be executed. The defendant remained exactly the same and did not change his expression. Alba has previously apologised for his actions, saying he didn't know so many people would die, but victims' families doubted Alba's remorse. The defence hasn't stated whether they'll appeal the court's decision. In Japan, the execution date isn't publicly released. Alba himself won't even know when it's his time, until one morning there's a knock on his cell door and he'll be led away to his death. James Elton, ABC News, Tokyo. A man facing more than 100 child sex offence charges dating back decades has been granted bail. 63-year-old Christopher Bulbrook was arrested by child protection detectives. It's alleged he was in a position of trust and authority when he sexually assaulted several girls, one as young as eight. He was charged with 105 offences, which police say occurred between 1983 and 2021 across the Capricornia and Wide Bay regions. He was granted bail with strict conditions. Novak Djokovic was chasing an 11th Australian Open title, but the Serbians' reign at Melbourne Park is over after a shock loss to Yannick Sinner. The young Italian star outplayed the world number one over four thrilling sets to win through to his first ever Grand Slam final. A win for the new generation of tennis. There's a new king in Melbourne. Yannick Sinner has become the first Italian to reach an Australian Open singles final beating a man who hadn't lost at Melbourne Park for more than six years. The young Italian was on top early. What a start. He broke the Serbian serve and won the opening set in just 35 minutes. Sinner's clean ball striking stunned Djokovic, who lamented unforced errors. Djokovic tried to get the pro-Serbian crowd involved, but Sinner, bursting with confidence, took the second set. Sinner smashing the semi-final. You can't keep a champion down. Amazing. Djokovic forced the third to a tiebreak, saved a match point before staying alive in the contest. It's Djokovic on the breaker. We're going for. But 22-year-old Sinner held his nerve in the fourth. And this time he breaks. Up a break, Sinner served for the match again and a piece of history. The confidence from, from end of last year has kept the belief that I can play against the best players in the world and, and I'm really happy that I can play Sunday my, my first final and, and, and let's see how it goes. But I'm really happy I come here with a smile and, and I try my best. And defending champion Arena Sabalenka will go into tomorrow's final as the raging favourite. Her straight sets victory over Coco Goff was revenge for losing to the American at the US Open. It will be an enormous challenge for her next opponent, China's Qin Weng Zhang, who will make her Grand Slam final debut. Tom Maddox, ABC News, Melbourne Park. 
An inspired bowling performance from the West Indies has Australia on the ropes midway through the second day of the second test at the Gabba. After the tourists posted a competitive first innings total, Australia is now seven for 178. The West Indies showed they had plenty of fight on day one with the middle and lower order helping the tourists recover from five for 64 to go to stumps at eight for 266. Joshua De Silva's 79 and 71 from Cabham Hodge did most of the scoring damage while the blistering 32 off just 22 deliveries from Alzari Joseph frustrated Australia's quicks. No respect at all from Joseph. We showed some fight today, we showed fight in Adelaide with the ball, um, but yeah, it's about just showing people that West Indies were still here and we want to show people that we, are, we deserve to be here. On a gloomy second day, the fight continued, Kevin Sinclair making the most of his test debut. Newly crowned ICC Cricketer of the Year, Pat Cummins brought himself on and immediately created a chance which went begging. Yes. When the wicket finally came, it was entirely of the West Indies making. All run out. Oh, no. Before Sinclair made his half century, as the tourists were eventually dismissed for 311. Australia's run chase started in disastrous fashion. Steve Smith gone for six in his third innings as an opener. He wasn't alone in struggling against the tourist bowlers. Edged away, great catch! That is a screamer! Manus Labuschagne, Cameron Green, and Travis Head all departing before the long break as the hosts collapsed to four for 24. Mitch Marsh launched a counter-attack. Up and over. But it was short-lived. The all-rounder gone for 21. Australia's perilous position could have been worse. Alex Carey lucky to survive when the ball hit the top of the stumps but didn't dislodge the bales. Carey made the most of his reprieve, smashing a rapid half-century before he too fell to leave Australia with plenty of work to do. Tom Wilde, the ABC News. Weather now with Jenny Woodward and Jenny Birdsville is in the news again. Yes, Jess, it's probably not the news that the locals want. Hello again. We've got heat wave conditions persisting over much of the state, so Birdsville had its hottest night on record with a minimum of 36.4. Now, that's not just a record for the town, but an all-time record for the whole state. This morning's lowest was a cool 14 on the granite belt, 19 in Toowoomba this morning, but 46 this afternoon in Birdsville, so a little bit cooler than yesterday and the cloud kept Winton down to 31 degrees but a humid 36 for Rockhampton and 32 in Townsville. Overcast and drizzly in the capital today still very steamy with 30 degrees in the city 32 for Ipswich but the dew point has been sitting around 25 to 26 degrees all afternoon so very uncomfortable conditions. Last night, the cyclone moved over land and weakened to a low in the early hours. It did do a little bit of a wobble as it got close to the coast, which, which pushed it north. So the eye didn't really cross the coast until about 10 p.m. And then we had a very strong northerly tail, which impacted Cairns all the way down to Mackay. Now, it did weaken to a low, of course, and has been moving west. And we've had a lot of storms spiralling out from it in all directions. We've got that severe system up in the northwest of the state and also over the territory and we've got the trough systems to the south. Tomorrow some showers and windy for Hobart while Melbourne could see a shower a top of 23 degrees there. Sydney hit 38 degrees today so they'll be having a welcome tw uh, 26 tomorrow and hot for Perth 33 expected. On to the chart and the low is going to track west and then curve to the northwest. It's moving very slowly so we could see some big totals over the weekend falls of up to 180 millimetres likely in any of the intense downpours. Meanwhile, showers and storms are going to continue ahead of the inland trough line. Some severe cells are possible and it's remaining very hot. We'll have pockets of extreme conditions in the southeast. On to those forecasts and of course we do have the severe weather warning across the north which could lead to flash flooding. Already there is moderate flooding in many rivers and uh, including the Flinders River and also in the Western River. So moderate flooding is possible in Winton tomorrow and on the weekend. Showers and storms across the interior, heavy falls north of Longreach, severe cells possible and we'll see some showers and storms about the southeast too. Severe cells likely south of Toowoomba to Brisbane. 
Brisbane itself could have a shower and storm, but I think the heat's going to be the focus. 36 to 38 degrees expected. And on the bay, northerly to 25 knots. Looking ahead, hot on Sunday too. Storms with the chance of 25 millimetres, Jess, on Sunday and Monday. So we've got a lot more to go before this weather event's over. Sounds like it. Jenny, thank you so much. That is ABC News to the moment. Thank you for your company. Enjoy the weekend. Good night. Good night.